Whatever I want or whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with some tequila, thank you. Was there a bit of a show happening or no, guys? Or? No. No, okay. I really okay. time to sync up before. Well, I... Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't want to come, it was a bit too cold. <laughs> All right, so everyone settled in? Yeah. Enough tequila shots down there? <laughs> I tried to find them, I couldn't. I found some fizzy water, but that was it. Red wine at the restaurant. Red wine at the restaurant, okay, fine. Yeah, that's good, that's good. So good, good Spanish red wine, yes? <laughs> that was clearly a bad one here. Yeah. Want to make it out it's a sometimes. <laughs> it's American accent. I, I, I didn't say English red wine because that would be even worse. <laughs> it's like first the UK and then that. I had English white wine actually when I was living there. The English it's champagne fine. as well. Yeah. They now make English champagne. But anyway, we're going off topic. I mean, we're going off topic. <laughs> it's not about English champagne. We're here to talk about uh, data grids now. All right. So. Um, I'm going to talk about, about the JBoss data grid. Um, I'm going to first talk about data grids in general, and then the JBoss data grid and InfiniSpan. Um, who's, who's heard of InfiniSpan in this room? See some hands? Oh yeah, it's, I, I can barely see, it's so crowded. <laughs> um, I'll talk a lot about it. Um, so yeah, let, let, let's kind of get started um, with kind of what, what are data grids. So earlier on I was talking a lot about caching. Um, the way I kind of see data grids is that data grids kind of are an evolution of a distributed cache. We started with simple single VM, single machine caches, and they were kind of useful for certain things, as I spoke about earlier. The moment your application is clustered, you can't use a single cache, a single single VM, simple cache anymore. You need to use something a little bit more sophisticated, right? To make sure things aren't stale, you're not reading stale data. Um, just because you cache something on one server doesn't mean another server can go and change it in the data store, right? So you end up with stale stuff. Um, so to get around that, you have slightly more sophisticated caches, distributed caches, caches that actually talk to one another. So every time you make a change somewhere, you can validate your neighboring caches as well, right? So, um, so that's what distributed caches are. Um, pretty, pretty popular, quite well used. Again, a well-known pattern to, to improve performance, to improve read performance specifically, read scalability. Um, and, and that's kind of where data grids come in now. Data grids take that a step further. Right? You've already got your distributed cache. What is a distributed cache now? It's basically a bunch of simple caches that, that reside in memory that can talk to one another, that can invalidate one another, and you have your data store behind it. You've got with a database or something on disk or whatever, right? Um, the whole concept of data grids takes that a step further, saying, do you actually need that database anymore? You've got all this temporary transient data in your caches. So caches primarily store temporary data, right? If you remove that data store and kind of make that a bit more persistent and a bit more durable, um, can you get away with that? Because that, that starts becoming a more interesting use case where the grid becomes your primary source of your primary store of data. You're not relying on that database anymore. The reason why you'd want to do this, the reason why this is desirable, is that now your data grid is not just a distributed cache, you're not just scaling reads, but you're also scaling out writes as well. So even the updates that you make to your data becomes a lot more scalable. Right. Uh, about to say something? We'll get to that later. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of where data grids came from. Now to make it useful, to make it viable as a primary store of data, just your simple API is not enough. Just simply storing and retrieving data is not enough. You need slightly more complex uh, access patterns around that. Um, specifically querying. You want to be able to query for data, just like you do in a database. You want to be able to run searches across your entire data set that's distributed across different servers. Right? You also want to be able to do things like pushing code to your data, not just pulling data back into your application. So things like MapReduce or to be able to uh, push callables into your grid and have them run uh, close to your data. You also want to be able to do things like control co-location. Like if you know that certain, certain objects or certain entries are always, always used together in the same transaction, you want to make sure they're stored together as well. So you want to be able to control co-location. The most expensive thing in any distributed system is the network. 
So you want to optimize that. You want to make sure you minimize network calls, you minimize network round trips. You really don't want a transaction that touches objects that are residing on different nodes and you have to try and coordinate all of that. So that becomes very expensive. So these are some of the features you want in a data grid. And this is where the API is a little bit more interesting, a little bit more complicated than a simple <coughs> distributed cache. So let's have a quick look at the JBoss data grid specifically. Um, as I mentioned, all of those things I said before, um, the JBoss data grid does all of this. It's a distributed in-memory data store. Um, it's a key value store. It's elastic and highly available. Just by being distributed in nature, you have the ability to, to, uh, to scale out. You can add more servers to your grid if you need more capacity. You can take servers out when you want to shrink capacity again. Um, and it's also highly available because it is distributed. If nodes are to fail, if servers fail, um, your application does not need to stop. Your application can still continue. Um, if you have adequate copies of your data, your data is not lost, your data is still durable. I'll talk about durability later on in more detail. Um, in addition to that, uh, it's, it's also manageable. Now, the more practical aspect of, of data grids is, is manageability. It, it's all well and good to have a very cool distributed system that you can scale out to hundreds of servers. But if you don't have the right tools to manage this, your sysadmin is going to kill you. Right? He's going to hunt you down in your sleep, find out where you live, and he's going to murder you. And you really don't want that to happen. Right? So yeah, having the right tools is really important to make sure you can manage this, this grid. Um, and this is open source as well. So it, it's built on, on top of Infinispan. Infinispan is the upstream um, LGPL licensed data grid project that, that I started. Uh, it's been around for a while now. It's actually close to four years now. Um, pretty active community, uh, active in the sense that it's not just people who contribute code. Um, we've got a pretty big community of users, of, of researchers and universities who use it as a research platform, people who contribute uh, tests, documentation, etc., etc. So it's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty big community. It's growing fast and and in addition to the actual code being open source, I mean the way I, the way I run this project is. Is, is the entire process is open source as well. It's not just the code. Right? So what I mean by that is, um, for example, um, the, the core Infinispan developers, uh, we have our weekly team meetings on public IRC. Anyone can attend, anyone can sit in, anyone can contribute ideas and thoughts, um, um, share, share, share use cases, share experiences, help drive the roadmap as well. So, so yeah, it's all pretty, pretty open, pretty transparent. Um, I'll have some links at the end in case anyone wants to participate and, uh, and join. Before I continue uh, in, into the rest of the talk, so I'm going to use the terms the JBoss Data Grid and Infinispan almost interchangeably. Who's familiar with Red Hat's model of, of supported platforms and, and upstream open source projects? Any hands? A few hands? So, I mean, essentially. We were just uh, talking about that. And uh, the girl was saying that, you know, if you don't have a PhD, you don't really understand how you number it. Frankly, I don't understand it myself. <laughs> Mainly because I don't have a don't PhD. Have a PhD. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but what I'm trying to capture, in a nutshell, this is what it is. Um, uh, we have supported platforms like, like RHEL, for example, which is what we, uh, uh, which, is, which is a hardened version of Linux, compared to Fedora, which is the open source of stream, um, fast changing, um, releasing very frequently, sort of not experimental, but but uh, just moving very quickly anyway. Awesome, yes. yes. <laughs> bleeding edge, bleeding edge is the word. <laughs> You're gonna have uh, sticky fingers covered in blood. Um, <laughs> that's what happens with the bleeding edge. So so Infinispan is is your bleeding edge compared to the JBoss Data Grid, which is your certified, supportable, enterprise grade uh, hardened platform. Um, just a little bit on version. So Infinispan 5.1 becomes JDG 6. Uh, Infinispan 5.2 is what JDG 6.1 is based on. Um, like I said, I'm going to use the two terms almost interchangeably in this talk. So it's, it's uh, well, fairly high level features. How does J Group fit into this? I'll actually get to that. I've got an entire slide about that. The question was about J Groups. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, I also want to mention Cloud TM. So like I, I mentioned that the part of the Infinispan community is, is academic as well. So CloudTM is an EU funded project that uh, has been around uh, for a couple of years now. And the goal of CloudTM is to, to build um, a, uh, a cloud-friendly 
Elastic Data Store, right? Uh, the actual the actual name CloudTM kind of is a play on uh, STM and software transactional memory to make it you know cloud transactional memory. That's kind of weird. So yeah, that's what happens when you let uh, academics choose a name. You need a PhD. <laughs> you need a PhD. Exactly. <laughs> the problem is there are too many PhDs in, involved here. Yeah. But anyway, so so the people involved in CloudTM, Red Hat's involved in, in CloudTM, we kind of help steer it to some degree. Uh, and the other two groups, the other two significant groups at least, are the University of Rome and the University of Lisbon. Um, they've got pretty big distributed computing departments. They do a lot of work in things like distributed transaction protocols, um, lots of network protocols and things like that. The good thing as far as Infinispan is concerned is, is they use Infinispan as a research platform. They get to contribute a lot of this new stuff into, into Infinispan. Um, the, the specific project itself basically funds a number of PhD students, uh, funds their research in these universities. And uh, if you want at the end, we can, I can talk about specific things that are coming out of it that are related to Infinispan, which are quite interesting. Standards, I mentioned uh, an entire talk on JSR 107 earlier on, so I'm not going to mention that anymore. Um, um, the next one's JSR 347, which is a which kind of builds on top of JSR 107. It adds more data, data grid specific APIs. So some of the things I mentioned earlier, like MapReduce, um, querying, co-location of data, all of that, that all comes under uh, JSR 347. I'll we'll talk about this a little bit more later on as well. So let's let's dive right into into JDG um, <coughs> architecture. There's an entire slide in J groups, as as I promised, and yeah, this is it. It's not a very big slide, but uh, who's heard of J groups here? Any hands? Too much. Quite a few. Too much. There's never too much. Don't be silly. Oh. <laughs> so um, J groups is is a um, peer to peer library, a peer to peer networking library. Kind of abstracts a lot of the um, um, network protocols from from your application. So you can get all the, the effects of, say, UDP multicast, even in an environment that is not UDP friendly or not multicast friendly. Um, it, it's very configurable, lots of things you can tune in there. But one of the specific things that I like about JGroups is that it is, it is truly peer-to-peer -peer in that no one node is more important than the next. Right? So you can lose any particular server in the cluster. Except node one. That's actually not true. Node two takes over as node one. But anyway, <laughs> that's a technical detail. <laughs> uh, but it is it is completely peer to peer, which means you don't have any single point of failure. You don't need to configure, um, say, a name node or a controller node or anything like that, which you need to then guard with your life. So you don't have any of that. Um, and then the good thing with with Infinispan being built on top of J groups is that Infinispan, as a result, is completely peer to peer as well. So again, no, no individual node is more important than the next one. If you lose any one particular node, you're not losing anything specific. Except a node. Except a node, yes. yes. Nothing more than losing a node. That's all, that's all that's happening. And you can always bring another node back in later on. That's cool. Um, JGroups is pretty mature. It's been around for a while. It's about uh, more than 10 years old, I think. Um, it, it, again, has strong roots in academia, in group communication academia. It was actually originally as a, really started out as a PhD project some way as well, since we like PhDs here. There you go. So JGroups core developers are part of Red Hat as well, I just wanted to mention. So um, we kind of work very closely together on this stuff. Uh, a little bit about architecture, how you'd actually use JDG in your application. We, we, we broadly support two major styles of interaction. The first one is, uh, we refer to it as library mode, and as the name suggests, what happens is you just get a bunch of jar files that you then put in your application. If you're writing a web app, you kind of wrap it up into your whole file and deploy it, that's pretty much how you use it. You programmatically configure, create, instantiate um, a JDG instance, or you could use all those CDI annotations that I spoke about earlier on as well. You could, you could do stuff like that. Um, so that's how you pretty much interact with the JDG. Uh, what you then do is once you create an instance, you start interacting with it, you store data in there, you um, use it to, to look up data, and then you fire up more copies of your application in more JVMs. It could be the same machine, could be uh, the same local area network. We leave, you can even deploy it in different, uh, different WANs as well, different data centers. I'll talk about that later as to how you configure that. Once you do that, basically the, the JDG nodes um, discover one another, they start sharing data, and you get to have this distributed data store across your entire cluster. 
this is a very interesting or a very easy way to make your application highly available, to make your application um, elastic as well. So if you need more copies to deal with more requests or to deal with more load, you can just fire up more copies of your application. Um, as long as your application is stateless and you delegate all state management to JDG, all the hard work kind of gets taken care of for you. This essentially is how a lot of app servers deal with clustering as well. So uh, the JBoss application server does pretty much this. It uses Infinispan internally to, to handle its HTTP session management, EJB session management. So when you need to start up more instances of JBoss AS, uh, the actual app server is stateless. And you can just fire up more copies of it. And all state management is delegated out to, to Infinispan. So this is a, uh, a specific case of the same, uh, the same pattern I showed you earlier. The only difference here is you only have one copy of your application in a single JVM. It's still a pretty useful thing to do because in this case, um, JDG acts as a JSR 107 cache. And you can still use it as a 107 cache. You still get all the benefits of that. Um, but in addition to that, you may start out this way. In future, you may then decide you need to actually cluster your application. You actually need more copies and you need to scale out. You can do that with minimal changes. You don't actually need to rewrite your application at all. Or you might have to in some cases, but you know, generally not really. The next um, important style of interaction here is what we call client-server mode, where you run your entire data grid is in a separate cluster outside of your application. It's not co-located in the same JVM as your application. To use, it, to use it in this manner, what you end up doing is you, um, JDG ships with a bunch of startup scripts. You use that to launch it in server mode. You launch several copies of it. Again, as before, they discover one another, they start sharing data, they form a cluster. Your application sits outside of that cluster and starts interacting with that cluster over a socket. This is a fairly, um, um, this is a style of interaction that I'm sure we're all used to doing. This is how you use a relational database, typically, right? You have a database sitting somewhere, you connect to it over a socket, your application sits somewhere else. So that's pretty much what we're doing here. Um, as long as your application can speak one of our supported protocols, you can, you can communicate with the grid. Now, we currently support three different, three different wire protocols. Uh, the first one is REST. I'm sure everyone's familiar with REST here. Hands, right? Yeah, plenty of them, good. If you don't, um, I can recommend a good book, maybe. I can recommend a few bad books as well, but. <laughs> so uh, REST, very easy to use, um, easy to debug, easy to write, uh, to write code to. Lots of benefits to using REST. You can, have, you can load balance it using an HTTP load balancer, you can use a hardware load balancer, but it's got some drawbacks as well. Yeah, REST is kind of slow, let's face it, right? It is slow. There's a lot of parsing of HTTP headers, it's quite verbose. And one of the main reasons why you'd want to use a data grid is performance. So it's almost counterintuitive to use REST as a protocol on top of a data grid. Um, so that's why we also support Memcached as a wire protocol. Uh, Memcached is a pretty, pretty well-known, pretty popular single VM caching daemon that ships the most Linux distributions. But what's more important is it's also a wire protocol to communicate with that process. And that's what we've implemented here with Infinispan. So we implement the memcached wire protocol. Uh, the reason why we did that, why we picked memcached is because it's quite an easy protocol to implement. It's text-based as well. Um, but the biggest benefit around that is that there are many clients available for the memcached protocol. Pretty much every programming language on the planet has got a memcached client. <clears throat> I'm sure you can even talk to memcached using a Lego Mindstorms machine. So you know you, you can basically. So no matter what you're building your application with, you can use. Uh, a JDG data grid as, as your backing store. Um, the memcached protocol has got a few, a few limitations though. One of the biggest limitations around it is how you deal with elasticity on your, uh, in your, in your uh, data grid cluster. Um, every time your topology changes, you've got to go and reconfigure clients. You can't exactly do that in any dynamic way. So it's one of the reasons why we ended up building a new protocol as well. So Hotrod's a protocol that we designed um, pretty much uh, specifically for Infinispan. It's very similar to the Memcached protocol. We kind of started with Memcached and said, what else do we need to make it better? What do we find that's missing? Um, now some of the things we, um, some of the desirable things we wanted to have there was for the protocol to be a two-way protocol. So we don't just want clients to talk to the server to say, store this or get me that. We also wanted the servers to be able to talk to registered clients. 
And that's quite cool, that's quite important. It means that if your topology on the server side changes, if you add more servers or remove some servers, your cluster can actually tell all registered clients, say, hang on, you don't talk to those guys anymore, they're gone. Or, you know, here are some new servers you can add to your server list. So that makes things a lot more flexible. You don't need to reconfigure your clients every time, you're, uh, every time there's a change in your server side topology. In addition to that, we also have something called smart routing. <coughs> I mean, I'll get into some of the details as to how we, how we uh, determine which servers actually hold which pieces of data later on. But um, in a nutshell, it's all based around consistent hashing. And if we can share the server topology with your client, and you can share the hash function with the client as well, you can build a lot of intelligence into your client. Your clients can directly talk to specific nodes in the back end where your data is located. So you don't have to do any proxying or any sort of you know, hopping around to find your data at the back end. That just translates to things being a lot faster. A lot faster, a lot more efficient, a lot less uh, traffic on the network and so on and so forth. Um, the, one of the current drawbacks, though, of using Hot Rod is the fact that we've only got a couple of clients around. We've only got clients for Java, Python, and Ruby at the moment. Um, I know that there is a .NET client being written, kind of experimental beta quality at the moment. Um, if anyone else wants to contribute more clients, please do. Happily encourage that. In fact, uh, give you a free T-shirt or something. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone wants a T-shirt, right? How would that? How do I compare to using, for example, one cluster? It's supposed to have also uh, client server bi bidirectional communication. So the question was, how does Hot Rod compare to Mod Cluster? Mod Cluster is specifically an HTTP uh, um, HTTP uh, load balancer. So yes, this is not HTTP. This is all binary. It's, it's a very very tightly compressed stream here. Yeah. So let's have a quick look at why you'd use one style of interaction over the other. Um, running JDG as a server's got a couple of very, very uh, strong benefits. Um, essentially, you can tune your data tier and manage it completely independently from your application tier. And this is quite a useful thing, yeah? It means that you can customize the kind of JVMs you use. It means that you can, use, uh, you can customize the hardware you use for your data tier as well. For example, you could use machines with more memory and less CPU and things like that. Um, the other important thing is application. Your application does not affect your data tier. So, for example, if you have a problem in your application, an application crash or whatever, it will not also take down a data tier node. Right? Taking down a data node can be quite expensive. Right? You've got to migrate data, rebalance things. Um, you want to try and isolate them. This, this, this is one way to do that. In addition to that, you can also share your data tier across different applications. Again, just the way you do with the database. You can have two or three different applications talking to the same data store, and you can do that here. Um, applications don't need to be JVM-based as well. Like I said, with Memcached or Hot Rod or even REST, you can pretty much use, um, you can use pre pretty much any platform you want to, to talk to your data tier. But of course, there are some reasons why you might prefer to use library mode as well. Um, at the moment, at least, library mode has got a lot more features. The APIs are richer, you can do more things with it that you can't quite do uh, in client-server mode. Uh, things like querying, things like MapReduce, you can't exactly do that uh, in client-server client at the moment. Um, the Hot Rod protocol is being enhanced to add those features to it, but that's just not here at the moment. In addition to that, the way you, um, the, the way you configure your data grid is quite different as well. So with the client-server mode, all you can do is provide an XML file a configuration file that configures your, your data grid and you start it up. Whereas if you're running in library mode, you can also programmatically configure it, and that means that you can dynamically change it based on how your application wants to wants to behave. So you, you, got, a, you got a bit more flexibility there. Uh, it's also extendable and embeddable. It means that you can, you can change some of the, the behavior of your data grid if you're running in library mode. For example, you can attach interceptors to your actual, to, to the core data container to add certain behavior, um, application-specific behavior. You can do all that. You can't do that in uh, client-server mode yet. Um, and finally, in some cases, it's actually faster to run in library mode because your data is in the same JVM process as your application. So that's one of the big reasons to run in library mode. So it's kind of a trade-off. I mean, this and that are pretty much diametrically opposed. I mean, having, having your data tier co-located with your code can be a good thing. It's faster, can be a bad thing if your application crashes, you're taking down a data node. So 
you know, what are the trade-offs that you got to look at? Let's have a quick look at architecture, um, how we've actually built it. So who here is familiar with Amazon Dynamo? Not Dynamo DB. Okay, same answer we have, okay. Uh, um, Amazon Dynamo DB is a service on, on the Amazon, their, their cloud ecosystem. I'm not referring to that. Uh, Dynamo is an academic paper uh, that, that talks about, um, that, that specifically addresses uh, distributed data stores and consistency across distributed data stores. So um, a couple of things from that paper that we've adopted in Finispan, one of them is a consistent hash based, uh, based distribution model. So consistent hashing is a fairly well-known algorithm uh, when you have a fixed uh, number of servers. It helps you determine which servers actually host which pieces of data. And this is all done algorithmically. It means that there is no metadata. You're not storing any maps or any sort of, um, any, any sort of metadata to help you locate where your data is stored. It's also, it also is not very chatty, so you don't do any multicasts or anything to try and look for data. It's all done algorithmically. It's a, simple, it's a fairly simple algorithm. Every node can compute, um, given a key, it can compute exactly which servers host that key. So that's very, very efficient. Um, and, and this is the same consistent hash algorithm that we share with clients when using Hot Rod as well. So even on the client side, that can be done. So you can determine which servers in the back end hold your data. What this translates to in, a, in, a, in the real world is basically that, that we, scale out, we scale in a linear fashion, uh, both in terms of throughput as well as capacity. So there are two reasons why you might want to scale out your grid. One is the trooper. If you actually want to respond to requests faster, if your uh, CPUs are being maxed out, for example. Um, so adding more servers does not slow you down. That's the important thing. Adding more servers does not add any extra overhead in terms of, uh, uh, say, for example, multicasting or maintaining a topology. You don't need to do any of that. Um, so, so yeah, you get the benefit of, of, of any extra server that you add almost directly. The next thing is capacity. The other reason why you might want to scale out is capacity, the ability to store more stuff, to have more memory. And again, because we're not storing any metadata or anything like that, uh, you, you get pretty much every extra uh, piece of capacity that you add. So every server that you add, you just your, your capacity expands outwards. So let's talk a little bit about durability. Um, so like I said, moving away from a distributed cache and onto a data grid, in conceptually at least. When you're talking about a cache, whether it is a standalone cache or a distributed cache, it's still a cache. It means that your data actually lives somewhere else. The cache is just a temporary place to put stuff. And because it's temporary, it means that it does not really need to be durable. It doesn't matter if you lose some of it, it's actually stored somewhere else anyway. But with the data grid, it's a little bit different. Durability becomes more important because you don't have a database behind it. You, have, you, you are the primary store of data. So we achieve durability in three different ways. Uh, the first one is replication. So up there. So basically it means that you maintain one or more copies of your data within the same cluster. And that's configurable. So depending on how durable you want your data to be, how big your cluster is, how unreliable you think your network or your servers are, you will tune that accordingly. Um, the second form of durability is persistence. So in addition to, to um, replication within a cluster, you can also persist it down to disk. Um, and this, this basically is, is the, the cache loader, cache writer SPI that I showed you in JSR 107. So that gives you a form of persistence. Um, and the, the third one is replication to a secondary cluster. Now I was actually doing this talk in Tokyo last week when that earthquake hit. And we were talking about, <laughs> we're talking about why would you need to replicate from one cluster to another, right? Quite simply, if an earthquake takes down one of your data centers, it's kind of useful to have uh, your data somewhere else. So it was uh, actually quite, quite uh, interesting that an earthquake happened right then while I was talking about it. <laughs> it made the point very clear. <laughs> oh yeah, before I continue, so and you can also mix and match these. You don't, you're not, you don't have to use just one of these forms of durability or the other. You can mix and match, uh, for example, replication within a cluster and persistence to disk, but not this. Or, you, know, yeah, you can mix and match them. So writing through to disk, um, I mean, I don't need to talk too much about this, basically, because I already spoke about cache loaders and cache writers earlier on, the JSR 107 talk. So um, the, the SPI that we have within Finispan is, 
is an extension of the JSR 107 SPI. So we've got a few more methods, uh, make it slightly more rich, give you a bit more control over your data store. Um, you can implement your own, uh, you can customize, write your own implementation if you want. I've had people write implementations that possess things to mainframes and stuff, and for some strange reason they didn't want to contribute that back to the project, but anyway. Um, yeah. Um, so we do support uh, an implementation that writes to a file system and one that writes to a JDBC cache store, uh, to a JDBC database. Now these two are specific to the JBoss data grid 6.0. I'll talk about what's coming up at 6.1 as well. We've got a lot more, uh, a lot more variety for you to choose from. So we talk a little bit about architecture, about, about consistency. Um, I mean, inevitably this, this, this point comes up as to, with any distributed data store, uh, what, what sort of consistency model do we follow? I mean, just to kind of sum it up, InfiniSpan is strongly consistent in that um, it, it kind of follows what databases do. So we started out as a distributed cache sitting in front of a database. Most relational databases, actually all relational databases, are strongly consistent and we kind of follow the same consistency model. Now that means that we can be, uh, we can be JTA compliant. We can actually um, have JTA transactions. In fact, we are fully XA compliant, complete with the uh, XA recovery as well, if anybody actually uses XA recovery. Any hands? Anyone actually use XA recovery? There's a hand back there, my god. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, but you know, I mean, so so like I said, this this point always comes up as to as to um, you know, eventual consistency and whether it's something we ever do. So let me just go. I'm spending a little bit of time talking about that. Who knows who this guy is? I'm sorry, it's not November. It's December already. <laughs> so Eric Brewer wrote, wrote uh, um, a couple of papers on distributed computing. He seems to know what he's talking about in that space. Um, supposedly a smart guy. Uh, another PhD there, you know? What the hell? Right? Specifically, I want to talk about the CAP theorem. Um, so there are three desirable characteristics of any distributed system. The three things are consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Consistency being the fact that all nodes see the same data at the same time. So in a distributed data store system, regardless of which node you speak to, if you ask for a particular piece of data, you should get the same answer, regardless of which node you talk to, right? That's consistency. Um, availability basically is a guarantee that every request that you send into your data grid or into your distributed store, you're going to get a response. The response might be an I don't know response, but you're going to get a response, right? Um, what's not going to happen is you're not going to just hang and, you know, I don't know, time out because you couldn't contact the server, right? If that's the case, that's not available, right? And the third thing is partition tolerance. This is the, um, the ability to, to continue operating at full, fully operational levels despite message loss in the network. And this is all based on one premise that networks suck. Despite what Cisco will tell you, uh, <laughs> networks are unreliable, and networks will sometimes randomly drop packets, and sometimes one half of your network can't see the other half, not because there's something wrong with your network, not because your router is actually on fire or anything. It's, uh, it, it, it just happens, and then you know, it'll, it'll heal itself after a few minutes or a few seconds. So what do you do in those situations? Well, the tricky part is you end up with something like this sometimes, uh, what we call a split brain or a partition. What this really means is that one half of the network cannot see the other half. And if you've got a data grid with, um, say, five nodes on each side, um, and your application can see both sides because the application is sitting outside of this network, and you start making changes to the same piece of data on both sides, and you start making different changes, and they start diverging, and then the network heals again, and then, you know, everything joins up. And how do you now reconcile what's the correct version of your data? What's, you, know, you end up in a very inconsistent state. So essentially what the CAP theorem uh, is all about is that when partitions happen, when those split brains happen, your data store can do one of two things. It has to choose between being consistent, i.e. making sure you don't have data that diverges, or it can be available in that it will continue serving requests. Now the way you maintain consistency when there's a partition is that you can do one of two things. You can either shut down and say, look, stop making any changes, right? Because I can't deal with this anymore. Or you go into read-only mode, which is effectively shutting down. You can read all this stuff, but you can't make any changes to it. 
That's how you maintain consistency. Or you can be highly available saying, you know what, continue doing whatever you need to do. You don't need to stop your application or degrade your, your, your uh, quality of, of service. Um, but that means that you're sacrificing consistency. It means that there is a chance that your data might start diverging and have multiple versions of the same piece of data. So that sounds pretty scary when you talk about, you know, when you, when you try and do a get and a key and you get two different versions coming back, that's kind of scary, right? What's, what's correct? Well, you know, consistency, uh, I love this slide. I don't know if you guys can read that. <laughs> I find that uh, quite funny. Um, consistency actually isn't that scary. Uh, eventual consistency. <laughs> uh, the world actually is eventually consistent. A lot of systems, not natural systems, are eventually consistent. A lot of biological systems are eventually consistent. In fact, the biggest, um, the biggest distributed computing system in the world is eventually consistent. That's the internet. The entire internet is eventually consistent. You make changes to DNS entries. Um, they don't, they don't propagate transactionally around the world. That doesn't really happen. Right? You can't really do that. And as long as you model that in your application or in the way you deal with it, as long as you know what to expect, it's not that hard to do. Um, essentially, most databases are all built around this principle up there called ACID. Everyone's heard of that acronym, right? Yeah. Yes? Good. So, um, and that uh, strong consistency is a big part of that, so you'll always be consistent. Whereas most, say, NoSQL engines and most distributed storage engines coming out these days tend to follow something else. Um, where you weaken, you weaken consistency and you sacrifice consistency to be highly available. Yeah. Um, like I said, most databases are typically ACID um, and most data grids as well tend to be quite, uh, tend to be strongly consistent. Uh, but the problem with being strongly consistent is that you can't really deal with network partitions very well and still be available. You will have to shut down, you will have to do something like that, go into read-only mode and you sacrifice some level of functionality. And this is kind of where a lot of NoSQL comes in, where they try and address that, where they try and address availability, and you instead sacrifice consistency, um, and then push the push the onus onto onto the application developer to expect inconsist inconsistent state and to be able to deal with that. But that's really a subject for something else. I'm not going to talk about that too much. Uh, regarding regarding InfiniSpan and the JBoss Data Grid, just to remind you, uh, we do follow a strongly consistent model. So so we are transactional and so on and so forth. Uh, but, but that's not all. We also want to be eventually consistent as well. So on the roadmap in the future, we are going to have two modes of operation where you can choose to run your data grid in an eventually consistent mode or in a strongly consistent mode based on what you expect, based on what your application needs to do. So, so far, all of what I've been talking about has to do with GDG 6.0. Um, this is what's coming up in future releases, 6.1. 6.1 is targeted for release um, very early next year, so around February-ish. Um, and we've got a few things coming up, specifically more persistence engines. So uh, the ability to write through to Cassandra, to write through to Hadoop, uh, MongoDB, a few other things like that. Uh, cross data center failover, the whole thing about the earthquake, you know, destroying your data center. Uh, that's going to be supported in 6.1 as well. Um, more clients for Hot Rod, like I said, uh, there, there is a .NET client in the works, there's a C++ client in the works as well. Uh, all that integration, uh, the, all those annotations that I showed you earlier on, the JSR 107 talk, all of that's going to be supported in, in, um, in JDG 6.1 as well. And, and this is an interesting feature as well, zero downtime cluster upgrades. Very, very useful if you want to be, a high, if you want to be highly available. Just because you want to upgrade your data grid doesn't mean that you have to shut down your application. Your application can still continue running and you can upgrade your data grid. Now that specifically only works if you're using it in client server mode, at least for now. Um, in future, we'll also support it running in library mode as well, but that's a lot more complicated. So that's all I've got on, the, on uh, JDG. Uh, let me talk very briefly about JSR 347 before I open up to, to questions. Um, it's a fairly new JSR, it's still blocking on the completion of 107, uh, mainly because we actually extend 107 and we build up on top of 107. Some of the features that you're going to see in uh, JSR 347, um, an asynchronous API, um, so essentially instead of just doing a put, you could do an asynchronous put where you get back a future and you can uh, query the result of that later on. 
and that parallelizes a lot of what you can do. Keeping in mind again that the most expensive thing in a distributed system is the network. You want to try and parallelize the network calls as much as possible. Uh, MapReduce. So initially we had a uh, quite a specific MapReduce API. We're kind of ditching that in favor of uh, Java 8's lambdas, which is kind of a bit natural, something that, that people are going to be more used to in future as well. Um, things like a colocation API, the ability to control where data is stored, um, give you some control as to, to be able to, to store data together on the same nodes, so the cost of your transactions are greatly reduced. And an eventually consistent API as well. Now one of the things about eventual consistency is it's not just a consistency model, it also affects API. Like for example, if you do a get, you might get multiple values back, so the API has got to reflect that. Um, you also want to be able to provide some hints to your data grid. So for example, if you get two or three values back, and your application actually knows, because you know your data, you know your model, you know your data model, you know your domain, and you are able to guess which version is correct, well, you should be able to provide that hint back into the data grid. So you know what, this version is correct, throw away the other ones. So again, that's an API thing as well. So that's going to affect the API of 347. I don't know why I have a black slide. Oh, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So one of the things about the way I mean, so I'm the spec lead of 347. The way I'm running the JSR is that I'm going kind to of treat it as an open source JSR as well. So it is. It is um, um, all going to be in the open. It's up in Google Groups. That's where our mailing list is. Anyone can join. It's not just restricted to uh, the JSR expert group. In fact, this is a, this is the key thing I want to drive home. I don't want this to be a vendor specific. In JSR. I mean, most, most JSRs tend to be, you know, vendor driven. I actually want this to be community driven because at the end of the day, I want to hear how people want to, how people use this stuff, how people find it useful, what APIs they find useful, as opposed to just vendors pushing what, you know, they think is the right thing. So, um, I do encourage people to join and uh, participate here. With that, I'm going to leave you with a few links. Um, where you can learn a bit more about the JBoss data grid and InfiniSpan. Um, you can join the InfiniSpan community as well. Uh, some links down there. And before I open the floor to questions, the first three most the first three questions get a copy of this. So uh, this is my book on InfiniSpan and JBG. Question: <laughs> What is the reference implementation of? You're not allowed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> what will be the the reference implementation of three four seven? Well, we've not decided that yet, but it's very likely to be, um, again, something something independent of any vendor. Uh, one of the proposals for the RI is, so you, I mean, you're familiar with the Adopter JSR program, and the Houston Java user group have adopted JSR 347. One of the things they're doing is they, they volunteered to build the RI and the TCK from scratch. That's a non-book question here as well. It's oh, it's a non-book question? Oh, bummer. <laughs> okay. So, number of question. Why is this a number of question? Because you already have a copy of the book. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my question has to do with the, like the concept of continuous queries running in the data grid, and uh, do you, is there actually support for that in the uh, in the JSR, or how does that? What does that look like? So this, I mean, as I mentioned, this is a very young JSR. A lot of this is not being nailed down. That's a very interesting point. I'd like to see continuous queries in there too. Um, get on the list and propose it. I heard there's a project called um, Hibernate OGM or something like that. <laughs> that will have an uh, implementation is. on InfiniSpan. Is that true? We could have a at entity and it will. Uh, magically, have all the all this stuff. I think that was well. The Hibernate OGM Hibernate. lead is over here, so I'll let him talk about it. <laughs> yeah, it was Hibernate OMG. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well the funny thing is that OGM oh, yeah. is something funny in French as well. So yeah. anyway, um, it's kind of a. If you look at key value stores in general, they are um, very often used as the very low level mm. area where you want to store data because of efficiency and the ability to do all, all of the things uh, Malik has been talking about. Um, 
and what at JWAS we're trying to do is to see what can we add on top of this very basic and fundamental piece that is uh, JDG, what could we bring on top of it? And OGM is one of the approach where you say, instead of just using key value store on a map, literally speaking, you, you're going to try and store entities inside this grid, uh, but make it look like you're using an existing programming model, which is JPA. Uh, OGM started as literally implementing JPA for in Finspan, and then we moved down the road realizing that the uh, kind of um, link between uh, the code of OGM and InfiniSpan was tiny enough that we could abstract it and we now have support for other solutions uh, including non-key value stores so that's it's kind of a multi-purpose approach but we try to provide the tools to make it easy to use these post you know relational databases uh, solutions out there. But it works? Yes well that's if, if it doesn't work for InfiniSpan it doesn't work for anything else because that's the one we started initially <laughs> with so well, the way, the way I like to look at OGM is, is basically uh, what, what Hibernate is for a relational database, OGM is for a NoSQL database. So you get the same JPA layer on top of a NoSQL uh, key value store or document store or whatever. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. well, you talk about the repartition and creating your, your data, data grid and so on. And I was wondering if you had some, um, some cook rules uh, in order to build those time with so many, uh, let's say about a thousand requests of a, a thousand car, then you need at least six or seven and something like that. Yeah. And if those kind of rule, rule of thumb are... So essentially capacity planning. Yes, basically. So um, th there aren't any specific rules, unfortunately, because, because it's very highly dependent on a number of things, like the shape of your data, how, you know, uh, how big your key value, the keys and values are, um, how fast your network is. Um, and a really whole bunch of things. So, and also what features you're using. So, for example, if you're using querying, that adds a certain overhead to maintain indexes and things like that, compared to if you're not. So, what, what I end up doing is, what I end up recommending to people is, um, we, we built a tool to help you benchmark and help you build the right configuration. And this is, this is called Radar Gun. This is open source as well. You can download it. It's on GitHub. Um, and, and I recommend actually using Radar Gun in your own environment. Model your, model your interaction, model your data as a test, as a radar gun test. It's a bit like writing a JUnit test, right? So you, you, you model um, um, what, what, what your data types are, what your configuration is, what you're going to use, um, and also um, what, what your read-write ratios are, things like that. You run it in your own cluster, on your own hardware, on your own network, and see how it behaves. And then you start getting performance numbers coming back, and then you can uh, use that to gauge how big your cluster should be. Thank you. And on the other hand, um, I had a question. Um, when do you switch from constituency to um, eventually constituency? Do you have a, a, another rule there? Because I, I think a lot of people are trying to move on the uh, NoSQL database just for uh, fashion design architecture. And uh, so I was wondering on the more PhD uh, answer. Well, again, I mean, it's more experimental than anything else. That experimental meaning that you, you run experiments and see how your network behaves. If you find that you are constantly um, seeing network partitions, then perhaps an eventually consistent approach is better. Now, the reason why um, I tend to start with a strongly consistent approach is that that's what people are used to doing. That's what people are. Uh, that's the way people are used to thinking when it comes to data. So I'd always recommend starting with that rather than confusing people off the bat. Because um, in most cases, you, you probably don't even need an eventually consistent system. Um, and it, it becomes a function of your cluster size. The bigger your cluster, the more likely it is that you're going to start seeing network partitions, the more likely it is you're going to start seeing split brains. So if you only have a cluster of three or four servers, chances are you don't really need an eventually consistent model. But if you're running like, you know, 500 servers, there's a good chance you might need to run into something like that. It also depends a lot of your application and how you consider your data. Sometimes consistency is just not something you can Even avoid, right? And um, you know that's it. And then you have to 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 stick with it. It's true of um, a lot of the settings. If you look at a lot of the document-oriented databases, they out of the box 
don't actually, I mean, when you save something, they say, okay, that's saved, but actually, the thing is actually going on uh, afterwards, afterwards, right? So what happens? Is your application okay to lose data or not? For many situations, or at least the majority of it, you don't want to lose data. So you would have to switch this, uh, I, I would call it the benchmark switch back the to- The fast um, mode. Right, the fast <laughs> mode, uh, back, back to reality, right? Um, yeah, but here and mainly with the OGM answer, uh, I, I think there you probably have um, a maturity reflection when you yeah. start creating your application with, uh, I would say, just a consistency model. So you base your thing on the, the model. And in, f in fact, OMG, quite answered to that, uh, that uh, OGM, sorry. Uh, answer this idea. You first start with a regular database and then you move to the uh, and eventually constancy uh, simply. But my question, my wonder was when you do the switch and how do you uh, evaluate? Is there something, some information, some uh, track log and things that helps you to, to do the, the moving? That's well, well first it's not question. that easy. I mean, you, it's not just switching a configuration, it's a lot more complicated. Okay, yeah, it's not it's not it's um i mean we in ogm we we uh we just delegate the consistency model to what's underneath so if you decide to go for an eventual consistency model let's say using i don't know let's say using cassandra uh, then you you choose this solution for a very specific reason and we just export the programmatic API that is uh, gonna let you store the data you used to program it but in Cassandra. But the consistency model, we don't try to simulate it or anything like that. I, I think the question is that um, eventual consistency will always affect API. Uh, the thing is, you start with a Oracle and then you switch to uh, God, uh, to Can't you uh, sit next to this guy? You can tell you're walking back and forth. Yeah. You, you start with a regular database, uh, Oracle, MySQL, or something, and then you switch to a uh, Scrooge, uh, uh, Hadoop, or something else. That, that was my idea. Maybe, probably not. <laughs> I mean that that's um I would love to see that in the future I don't I wouldn't hold my breath on that it's it's um simply too complicated there's so many things you give up that you don't necessarily realize when you go away from acid and transactions on a relational database that just saying oh yeah I'm just using all my gps stuff and then switch to no sql and life is going to be good yeah. it's not going to work well OGM is not trying to pretend to do that, but we say that you reuse your knowledge of how you persist your object into a data store, so all the programmatic API is going to be the same. And technically, yes, at the early phase of the project, you'll be able to switch from one to another to see if you're comfortable with one solution or another. Um, down the road, once you're in production, moving from one system to another, I, I don't pretend I can solve that problem. JDO solved this problem that 10 years true. ago right. and you killed it. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? No, you didn't. Um, I think the uh, directory, uh, Lucene directory uh, implementation based on infinite span, I'd like to know whether you actually recommend using it. And then, uh, how would it compare to an application which handles distribution at the application level instead of the store level? So the, the question was around the Lucene directory implementation. Um, for those of you who don't know, InfiniSpan does have an implementation of Lucene's directory where it stores indexes. So if you're using Lucene and you don't want to store your uh, indexes in memory because it's uh, volatile um, and you're running on a cluster, and you don't want to store it on disk or in a database because that again is too slow, you just want to store it in distributed memory, you can do that uh, with InfiniSpan. Um, so the question is, do I recommend it? Uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> um, and what was the next question? Sorry, yeah, um, part of it. How does it compare to an application which handles distribution at the application level by merging the result of the queries, for example, instead of... Right, because that adds a lot of extra complexity to your application. If you want to try and um, um, have individual indexes on individual servers and then run a query across all of them and then try and do that merge, um, that makes it a lot more complicated for your application, but also what it does is it, it also bloats your, your memory footprint. 
because you're pulling back potentially a lot of data from each server, most of which you don't need if you're looking for a top 10 or something like that, and you're throwing away a lot of stuff. So pulling all of that into memory in one place and trying to do this merge in memory, it may not even be feasible in some cases. Okay, so I think my next question is, how does this direct implementation work in order to avoid round trips over the network? Um, it, it, it doesn't avoid round trips. Round trips still happen in, in certain cases. All it does is it, it gives you an implementation like a, a way to otherwise store things on disk. It just um, chunks chunks your byte stream up and puts that in the grid. So yeah, some of these chunks are going to be in different servers. You're still going to have those round trips. So that doesn't go away. It just hides the complexity from your application. And does it perform some kind of read ahead of data in order to not transferring every byte every every time losing it as a read byte or something? I'm not entirely sure of that, um, but yeah, I can, I can look it up if you want. I can, yeah. In fact, uh, you might know a bit of that. No, you don't? Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah. I didn't write it myself, so I can speak to the guy who wrote it. <laughs> There's one, one benefit in... So the traditional way to use a Lucene directory is to say, well, I'm going to put it on disk, and then I'm going to copy this index across my cluster to have a local copy and be fast on query. But then I've got some kind of delay in the changes I do on my index and the copies that are on many different slaves. Uh, and it, so that's the copy model. The, the other model is to say I'm sharing the same index on, on a, let's say, a network file system or something like that. But then that requires a lot of direct round trips. And uh, it requires a massive lock on NFS, which is quite problematic. What, what an, what's interesting about InfiniSpan is that um, it, it's sort of the second model, except that when you do a change, it's immediately visible to the whole grid for, for very cheap sense to the, the consistency model, instead of, of having like a copy that is done, let's say, every 10 minutes or something like that. So it's kind of a, a benefit you can get from from there. And also having everything in memory might be might be faster in, in your approach, <laughs> even with the network one compared to having to do a disk seek and load the appropriate you know segment and then uh, use that information. Do you know there are people doing NRT search using InfiniSpan? I'm sorry, what's it? Near real time search? Um, I, I, I'm not sure again. Okay. Could tell you. As in, do you see near real time or like, um, sort of, except that, well, no, actually, because the thing is, near real time works by having both, all, uh, having all queries and all changes done on the same server because you li literally have um, uh, exclusive access to the index readers and writers. So you Hibernate Search, which is the solution that it used to the query in InfiniSpan, actually lets you support that, but not in a cluster mode. So we're, we're not magically uh, enhancing that, though. Though it depends how you define near real time. It can be right. fast right. enough for you. Right? Is that, an, is that a, a Lucian-specific concept? Or? Well, near real time, generally speaking, no. But then there is a special mode in Lucene that is called near real time where all the ch you, you can literally query changes in memory before they've been flushed to the to the disk. Yeah. And we support that, but that requires you to go through this node to actually have the info in memory and answer the query. Questions? Nobody else? No more questions? Really? So I guess the talk was that good that you got all your questions answered, huh?